Hi, uh, so I'm Oscar Clark. I'm a Chief Strategy Officer at Fundamentally Games and I'm here to try and talk to you about my experience and how I, hopefully you can learn from that and share tips uh, with each other around the role of games business development. Uh, for a bit of history, uh, I've been around in games for far too long, um, since 1998. I've been running game services and platforms. I've also been doing evangelism for a number of organizations like NVIDIA and Unity. Um, and also been kind of planning and designing platforms and running game services for a long time. Uh, obviously, I'm obsessed with games as a service and even wrote the book on the subject, which, uh, you know, apparently there's another one now, now as well. So I'm going to have to do an update on my book. Um, so the key thing is that I want to try and share with you kind of my experience and, and, and what I found valuable because it's something that's come up recently internally. We've hired somebody in our team. We've had to sort of share with them our experiences so that they can learn how to be effective and build relationships. Um, so, you know, let's face some uncomfortable truths. For some people, selling yourself, your game, your company is a nightmare. For others, it's a dream come true. We all have different reactions to the principle and the roles of uh, the experience of, of connecting with other people and trying to get a deal. You know, whichever side you fall on, there are some key tips which I'm hoping can transform your effectiveness, but I don't want it to become one of those kind of like classic TED talks that, yes, you can only, if only you do this, um, you know, we're not trying to do sort of self-help group here. Um, what we are trying to do is really show what's unique about game dev um, business development, what's really important about it, but also some fundamental techniques that I've learned through sales training processes, through things called strategic sales um, and various other pieces, and try and show how those techniques can apply in a very human way, in a very personal way. And hopefully we can be uh, better at engaging in the long term with people in our industry, but with a purpose. That's really what I'm trying to pull off. Um, and, and to be frank, for every role I've been involved with, whether it's been platform designing, whether it's been as an evangelist, obviously, uh, whether it's been a co-founder, I've had to learn to embrace sales. And although here I am with a stupid hat and jacket in the middle of um, the height of summer in the UK uh, with, with my air conditioning unit off, so it doesn't make too much noise, this kind of, kind of presentation, this kind of excitement, this kind of uh, enjoyment I'm trying to share with you didn't come naturally. I'm not a natural salesperson. I'm a natural enthusiast, but I've never learned the love of the clothes. And the problem I have is I've always been somebody who wants to fix things. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about kind of like the attitudes and the objectives and what we want to do, because I want you to come out of this feeling that you've got something extra to think about, a different perspective, whether you're an expert in business development or if you're brand new to it, We've got something that makes you feel a bit more comfortable that you can try something else and be more effective. That's what we're trying to do here. And hopefully at the end of this, we'll have enough time for questions and we can share a bit more insight and hopefully we can get some insight from you guys as well. So first thing, very first thing I think you need to do is you need to work out what does success look like to you? I think really understanding what success looks like is incredibly important. Uh, and that's not necessarily as uh, clear cut as you might think. Um, so I just, in, in, there was a couple of extra people coming in a bit later. So I've just added them in. What does success look like to you? Uh, I mean, obviously if you're raising money, if you're finding business partners, if you're pitching, um, these are all integral parts of anyone in game development. I mean, if you think about it, they're as vital a role as being a coder or an artist or a producer or a designer. The team can't succeed if somebody is not going out there and making sure that that is as effective, you know, with some relationship, with some deal, with some process. So I think it's, um, there's, a, there's a few um, folks I know who suffer a little bit from imposter syndrome in terms of uh, business development, and we shouldn't because we are an integral part of the team. The key is to work out what success looks like and then to qualify and importantly close the opportunities that make sense for that team. That's the skill set that we're trying to do. It's not just about here is a list of things that are on offer. Here's a list of prices. You're going to get these people to buy it. That's not what we're doing in game debt generally. What we're doing instead is finding opportunities and relationships. 
So before you even think about going out and setting up meetings at all these amazing online conferences we now have, you need to understand what success looks like for you personally, but also for the team as a whole. You know, what is it you're wanting to achieve? What is it the team needs to achieve? Some of the things I think are really important in this is to think about that, you know, it's not just about making money. It's always important to have something else you want to gain, whether it's learning something or maybe you're, you've got a love for a genre. Maybe you, um, you, you want to communicate new ideas. Um, I mean, let's face it, you know, making money isn't you know, enough. If you're only interested in making money, there are a lot less risky ways to do it than making games. So what are those deeper motivations for the team? And how do you make sure you've got a clear common understanding so that when you're out there having a meeting with somebody, you know that you're embodying the identity of the company that you're representing. You know, it's, it's really important to understand, you know, that all of these elements, all of these kind of motivations, because actually what helps you is really to understand how you notice what a good opportunity could be like. Because unless you understand the motivations of the team as a whole, how are you going to notice when somebody says something that's not quite on your agenda, but actually could unlock a whole new potential? And again, based on that, thinking around that, I think it's important to kind of, I know it sounds a bit cliched, but understanding the company vision. I think one of the important things that stands out, the difference between kind of faking it and, and doing it for real is a vision should be a direction, a set of directions. I like to think of it like um, Peter Pan's Neverland. It, you know, it's not a place, it's second star to the left and straight home till morning. If you think about what that means, it means that you can use the identity, the purpose of the organization as a way of framing what success looks like, what choices look like, what achievements look like. You think about it like that, it's really useful. For us, we're a living games publisher. From that, you can understand that we are after games as a service, we're after long-term engagement with players, we're after experiences where we find games and we make them successful. How do we describe that vision? Well, we say getting more players, doing more things, more often and for longer. So those two phrases help us understand what a deal looks like, what a relationship looks like with an investor, what a relationship looks like with you know, an ad company or whatever else, or tech company. All of these things start becoming more important. It's also another thing that's quite useful and understand the values. You know, what, what does it matter? What matters to you as an organization? And for us, it's curiosity, tenacity, and transparency. Now, can you define your organization, a work organization you're working with in these ways? You know, not necessarily this language, you might have a different language. In fact, I hope you have a different language because it's a bit rubbish for us if everybody's the same. We need to, you, you would need to be, think about how can you communicate and embody the brand that you are talking for, uh, that you're trying to support, and how you can make very immediate understanding of the decisions you've got to make so that when you're talking to somebody, you can be quick, you can be incited, you can be engaging. So I think if you think about all those things, it gives you the ability to try and understand the priorities in any given conversation. So when you're talking to an investor or a supplier, you understand better what the successful outcome could be because you understand what your company or organization needs. And so starting out that way and also taking into account what their organization needs, now we can start looking at the potential pathways. Now we can start looking at ways we can have a conversation with somebody and that's also how we can find those unexpected opportunities which come up. For me, ironically, most of the best conversations I've had in BD have been at the bar at some big event like GDC when I bumped into someone I haven't seen for 10 years and we end up chatting about what's going on in game dev. Uh, and it's amazing how it's those moments where you have opportunity to network that can really transform what happens to you as a, as a business. Anyway. Let's think about picking our battlefields. If we know who we are and what we need, we can then identify the people that we should be talking to. And more importantly, the best way to engage them. Now, obviously we can do things like cold emails or LinkedIn invites, that's perfectly valid. But unless we're very careful, if we do that too much, it can just get to the point where it's simply annoying people. 
Last thing we want to do is annoy the very people we're trying to engage with. So that means that we need to find natural opportunities to meet and network with relevant people. Now, if you think about that, you know, that's that means we actually got to think about who it is we want to meet, where we want to meet them, what those locations, those events, or those online experiences say about what they're looking for and try to use that effectively. Now, obviously, the last 18 months has been crazy. The pandemic's been a kind of mixed bag with a total pause on in-person events. So we can't have that face-to-face -face coffee that we used to have. Or uh, I used to go up to the tea rooms just above the GBC halls. Uh, best place for ha uh, having meetings because it's nice and quiet and civilised. But you bump into so many amazing people at the same time. Um, but we can't do that now. Um, well, we haven't been able to do it. Hopefully, we're starting to get to a place where we can. But I think the online events have been amazing. There's been an explosion of these online events and these meeting applications. Some are great, some are not so great. But I think we've had an unprecedented opportunity to connect with people in ways we haven't been able to previously. The number of two to three day back to back uh, meetings that we've had, you know, 30 minute meetings back to back, it's brutal. But it meant that we've been able to meet more game developers, more investors, more other publishers, more, you know, technology folks than ever before it's actually been a massive bonus in some ways um so it's obviously you've got to learn to adapt you've got to look at the, the opportunities but i think it also is important to think about choosing your targets you don't have to do every event not every event is going to give you the best value we found a lot of benefit from going to local online events because quite a lot of the local talent will be there but at the same time We've also seen that a lot of the same people are turning up time and time again, all of the other events. So working out who we want to meet where can be really important. And that means taking time to check, taking time to think, is this an event that we want to attend? Is this an event that's going to give us a reward? What kind of level of effort do we need to put to each one? Because it's exhausting. You need a high level of grit to survive the process, especially if you want to survive it with a smile on your face. And frankly, what's business development? We can't keep a positive attitude because, you know, we're not going to excite people about what we are if we're not feeling it at that particular moment because we're in our 30th back-to-back -back meeting. Um, so what kind of events are we talking about? Well, there are lots of them, obviously. Um, you know, these are just a, a bunch of them that what we happen to think are quite interesting. Um, but it's it, it, it's fascinating. We, we, we're looking at packs in particular. So... At the moment, we're focused on game developers. We're not currently focused on consumer audiences, but you might. So you might need the EGXs and the PAXs as well. Other people will be more focused on business to business. Some people will be in mobile. Some people will be in PC. Some people will be pure console. So finding where the people you need to talk to are and how you can engage with them is vital. Uh, and there are so many really good events. Um, but the bottom line, I suppose, is really understand, you know, what are the potential players who go to those events going to be looking for? Because it's not just a case that those events have a specific agenda. It's that the people attending those events have their own agenda. And that is then through the lens of the event they're attending. So we have to think about the experience in all of these different nuanced ways. Now, the problem we have is that we can't network, as I mentioned before. But you can still talk to people online. There are lots of um, uh, Slack groups, Discord groups out there of um, industry business development people. Um, you know, they're very friendly and very supportive. Uh, we're in a very unusual industry like that. So you can find out which events are good for you. Now, for me, uh, we found Pocket Gaming Digital. Well, okay, I'm biased on that because I often end up hosting it. Uh, things like Game Finance Market. Um, we have historically found Rares and EGX useful, not, not so much at the moment, but we think that's going to be hugely important later. We've currently got Gamescom and GDC going on right this week. Um, so we're also using Meet to Match uh, in all sorts of territories. So we've got access to GDC's sign-up system, but we've also got the Meet to Match system. We actually find the Meet to Match system is really useful, but you do get quite a lot of the same people attending. Anyway, enough of that. What do we do? Now we've worked out there's places to go. What are we going to do? We, maybe we find a list of people. Maybe we think that, you know, it's, it's um, here are the kinds of folks we want to talk to. What are we going to do? Well, do your research. 
you know, find out as much as you can about each company that you think might be useful to talk to. A lot of meeting systems, um, uh, the online ones in particular, uh, only open up about two weeks before the event itself, sometimes even less. And that makes it very difficult to have enough time to prep, especially when there are so many events going on. It's almost a constant barrage. But take the time to look up the company and their offering and it also the individuals where you can. You know, it doesn't take that long to do a Google search or LinkedIn search. Find out if you're connected, find out if you have any history with them or if you share you know, understanding what they do based on what they show. Now, in some cases, you might also be able to, you know, say, look up their game on Steam, on Steam, um, um, Steam Spy or um, Steam Data Suite or something like that. Or you, if you're mobile, maybe you can look them up on the App Store, uh, potentially even use tools like Reflections or um, App Annie. Uh, all of these things just give you a kind of better sense of where you think that company is going to. And even if it, you're looking at things like press releases from that company, again, just gives you a better sense. The key thing, though, is use that to qualify as much as possible which meetings are likely to be useful. You know, it's, it's really important to take time and think, is this company someone which is useful to do? And also, what do we want out of a conversation with a company like this? you know where can we add value where can you know where might they be looking for value uh, i think doing that that homework is enormously helpful it saves you a lot of time it means that you're much more proactive and informed when you have a conversation with somebody it means that you come across much better and you come across as interested and i think that's important because we should be interested in the other person you know, and I think that's really, I think, key. I mean, we should be listening and be interested in other people if we're going to come across as interesting. Um, and if we have a goal and we don't understand what the other person needs, we're not going to achieve our goal. So the other thing I think it's important to do now, not every game company on those meet to match systems will fill in their details, but you should as fast and as early as possible because it builds up a sense of identity. It makes you more interesting to talk to, especially amongst those other teams that haven't got around to doing it yet, that haven't bothered. Uh, we find it really helpful to set up a template and to make sure that template makes the company as attractive and interesting as possible to the kinds of people that we're looking for. You need to say what it is you want because you want other people to qualify you. I don't want to have lots of wasted conversations. I want people to know what we want what we're trying to achieve and if they think it's worth having a conversation it's fantastic that's not to say we wouldn't have conversation with other people of course we want to have conversations with lots of people because you never know when it will be useful but if you're going to have set up meetings let's make sure we qualify and let's make it easy for other people to qualify us an analogy i've always found really useful is to think about this in the kind of way that you look at sailing. I know not everybody gets done sailing. I did sailing as a kid, but it's this ability to sort of work out how you can get anywhere, even against the direction of the wind. But you have to know where the wind is going. And then you need to do a series of tacks or, or uh, jibes to um, turn and twist. So make the direction of the conversation, direction of the engagement, go where you need it to go. So understanding the other person is critical to that, because if you don't understand the other person and what they need, how can you know the direction of the wind, direction of the conversation is likely to go? You need to be able to avoid the obstacles. In fact, one of the things I would suggest is keep a log of all the objections you experience. It's just useful to know what do people say. Sometimes it will be in a reaction just to say, go away, I'm not interested right now. Other times it'd be really insightful. The more you understand that, the better. So what I think is fascinating about using this sailing analogy is not just that you can get anywhere, but also if you think and plan by the nature of the direction of the wind, you can also increase your speed. You can be much more effective. You can be much quicker. And so I think thinking about this in this kind of way, by thinking about the objections of the other person, the objectives that they have as well, by understanding the direction they're going to want to take the conversation, um, that's going to be really useful. A, a, another quick thought that's worth you know, bearing in mind, what's going to get them promoted? You know, what's going to get them their bonus? You know, what's going to get them 
to have success in the game that they're trying to release. You think about that, think about what's in it for them. And you have more empathy for them and you can think about how you can show what's in it for you is also gonna be useful to what's in it for them. So having a plan, having a direction, having a sense of, of attainment, you know, what is the goal? Even if it's very, very short, having a sense of what the goal is, but knowing that that plan is never going to be linear. It can't be linear. You've got to navigate your way from presenting who you are, understanding who they are, understanding what their opportunity for them is, what the opportunity for you is, and how you get a common goal. All those directions are really important. I actually think there's um, two ways of looking at this. Um, you've got the, the kind of relationship funnel and you've got the sales funnel. Um, now, what I mean by that is there's no such thing as a wasted meeting. I know I talked about qualifying and I still stand by that, but actually realizing that every meeting has a potential to learn because you're communicating what you're doing to somebody else. You're testing that method of communication, that language that you're using. You're also learning about the other party and where they fit into the ecosystem. You may also be learning lots of information about the state of the market, what's going on, what people are thinking, that gives you a perspective that's not currently yours. So thinking about these two separate funnels, you can think of the relationship funnel as the long term and the sales funnel as the short term. In the long term, you know, you want to have a wide reach, a range of people that you connect to. You know, I've got over 10,000 contacts on LinkedIn, most of whom I've met in person. Obviously, over the last year, the proportion of people I've met in person is a lot lower than usual. <laughs> Who guessed? Um, but it's all really important. But then, rather than just connecting to people, you need to develop those relationships. Why do you think we do these webinars? Why do you think we do all these talks? Why do you think we want to network so much? Because developing the relationships and finding those that naturally filter out into something positive that's useful at some point to everybody concerned is really useful. Engage with people and nurture those relationships. And what you find is that I have people contacting me I haven't seen for 10 years saying, oh, Oscar, I hear you're doing this now. Can you help us with this? The long-term relationship funnel is incredibly important for lots of reasons. There are business values for doing it because you never know where people end up. So really, seriously, never burn bridges, just not worth it. But also, you never know who you can help. And also you find that these very people that you nurture turn out to be people who can be lifelong friends, people who you have common history in the industry. I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, we had a, a coffee catch up the other day and 90% of the conversation was about his work on Angry Birds. It was, it was ridiculous, but we got to, as a result of that conversation, we kind of rekindled a friendship. Also, he identified three other companies he's working with who might want to do, you know, live ops experiences. That's not me being mercenary. It's just trying me to show you that there's a, there's a separate agenda about relationships than there is about sales. With sales, we have some very specific things. I thoroughly recommend watching the film Glen Gary, Glen Ross. Uh, I know it's the worst experience of sales training on the planet, but it's also funny if you've ever done any sales training. Um, Alec Baldwin is a genius uh, in terms of his presentation of that. Um, but there's something true behind uh, this process, the sales funnel. We can't think of things as one and done. We've got to build awareness. We've got to generate interest. We've got to build desire and create reasons to act. If you think about that in the short term flow of what you're trying to do, building awareness, interest, desire and action are really critical. And you can't, um, you know, you can't actually uh, expand your, um, so you can't, you can't solidly lock down all of that usually in one meeting. That's just the reality. And um, then I was talking about the um, odor loop. Yeah, that's a different a variation of it. So observe, orientate, decide, act, which is, uh, I think, is that, is that a military thing? I can't remember. I can't, yeah. But the psychology of these processes is really interesting. Um, anyway, getting this stuff together really kind of, you know, these, getting these things in your head really help you.
because it means that when you're having a session with somebody, you're able to be human and relate to people, but you will do so with a purpose. It allows everybody to remain positive because you can see the direction of the conversation, but also it allows us to be realistic because we don't necessarily know whether a conversation is going to lead to a real opportunity or not. We can break quickly when we realize that there isn't one because we don't want to waste anyone's time. We want to move on to the next opportunity and the next conversation without burning those bridges. So if we're upfront, if we're honest, if we show a direction, if we have this positivity, if we're dealing with these, these flows, then we can actually be much more effective. And the other thing, I think the critical thing is to always be learning. Every single meeting I have, I'm trying to absorb as much as I can about what that person feels about the way the industry is going, about the way their company is working, about what the market opportunities might be. I want to understand them. I want to understand, you know, what, what do they care about? What, is, what matters to them? What drives their motivation? Is there a aff natural affinity between us? How do I develop and, and support that? Because that humanity is actually the important thing. People don't buy things they buy from people so you know, you know biz dev is about being in relationships with people um, so a couple of other sort of thoughts uh, before we get into practical tips if you're dealing with a larger organization and um, there's it's really useful thinking about the structure of the hierarchy and maybe even map it out genuinely you know draw the org chart if you can get hold of an org chart in larger organizations that's amazing so you need to do your research but in particular what you're trying to do is work out what the roles are of every person in the company now i didn't want to use the language of pawns and knights and bishops and rooks because there's so much kind of overlaying kind of uh, emotive weight to those. I don't, I don't mean it like that, but think about three things. Is this person a gatekeeper or are they a um, subject expert or are they a decision maker? They're the three areas we really want to think. So think about the gatekeeper. So the role of the decision maker is to decide. They can make a decision without having to go elsewhere now that's not always the case but they might have some constraints on that for example there might be a budget um you know they may have to have it signed off by a board member but if they are actually the only person who will make that decision that can still count as a decision maker obviously the higher up the organization that person is the less sign off they will need therefore they're the person you actually want to deal with and for some people, to, talking to anyone but the decision maker is a complete waste of time. The gatekeeper, their job is basically to stop you getting to talk to the decision maker. I mean, it's a bit cynical way to describe it, but essentially, you've got to understand if you're dealing with a gatekeeper or not. And the gatekeeper is really, like I say, a barrier. However, if you manage that relationship with the gatekeeper well, they can also become your advocate. And if that gatekeeper is a subject expert, in, in other words, they are the person upon whom the decision maker relies in order to make their decision, then that individual can be incredibly important. Now, subject experts aren't always gatekeepers. They may be separate gatekeepers. They may be separate subject experts. Sometimes they're the same person. But understanding how that dynamic of the larger organization works is really critical. So if you're dealing with a publisher and you're talking to their scout, just because the scout thinks this is the best game since sliced bread, I, I had a particular publisher we had a particular game with, the guy we were talking to was so excited, he basically said we had a deal this the very first meeting. Turned out we didn't because the decision maker had already got a game of that type signed. There wasn't any space for it. This guy wasn't the decision maker. He was essentially a subject expert and therefore couldn't get approval. So knowing that, understanding the dynamics of the organization, understanding what the interests of organizations are beyond the individual is really useful. But obviously you want to understand the individual as well. What is the role they play? And how do you, how do you help them become your advocate? And even if you don't get that deal because of some other thing in the background you have to remember that you don't know everything that's going on in their lives you don't know everything that's going on in that organization often people will turn you down often people will um 
you know, not say yes, which for something that is so obvious that you should be saying yes to, from your perspective. And in practice, what turns out is there's something else going on you don't know. What I love about it though, the number of times the subject experts or gatekeepers, even sometimes decision makers, sometime down the line are in a new organization and they remember the, the relationship, the meeting that we had, the meetings that we've had. They remember that shared history and that's something that can go very well for in our favor. Okay, so let's do a talk practical. So I want you to feel like you can come out of this webinar really kind of having something that's practical and, and useful. And I did think about a number of very specific sales techniques, which I can ha absolutely talk to you uh, about if you want to. But I thought instead, I'm going to pick on a few much more kind of direct uh, personal things. So first thing, be memorable. The way you present yourself is your own brand, says he with a top hat and, and jacket on in the middle of the summer heat. Um, I know it's an extreme. I know that, you know, you don't have to take it that far, but even things like, you know, there are teams out there that wear um, orange uh, jackets and, or orange trousers. The reason they do that is because at the end of the conference, physical conference, you can see them at the, across the street. There you go, there they are. They're going into that bar. You know, it's them. You know it, you recognize them. It says something about the identity of the company. Uh, they're part of a tribe. And I'm gonna to go to that bar and chat to them because why not? And you want people to be able to do that with you. Uh, you, but do your own thing. It's got to be your own flavor. It's got to be authentic. And that includes the way you talk, the way you engage, the way you use your hands when you talk to people. Um, you know, leaving that positive impression that's lasting matters because you never know when you're going to meet them again and when that positivity will come back and, and pay dividends. Second, listen. I am the worst. Any of you who have been in meetings with me know I talk way, way, way too much. Now, don't get me wrong. There is actually method in my madness. I use the technique of active listening because I use a consulting mode of business development, which is about me giving you value in abundance. Well, at least that's the intention so that I'm kind of wowing you with my knowledge and expertise because I'm old, because I can, I've done most things. It's, it's um, not necessarily the best answer, but it is the reason I do it. But whilst I'm doing that, I am still listening. I'm looking at body language. I'm looking at your, you know, the way your eyes are responding. Well, are you looking at me? Are you taking notes? Are you on your phone? I'm looking at how you respond to the noises that you make. That active, intentional listening. I will phrase things. I will use three phrases time and time again punching through messages to see if that changes the way you respond but equally what I really need to do is sometimes just stop talking how can you find out what the other person needs how can you find out what's going to get them promoted how can you find out the way that company is going to succeed through your involvement with them too if you don't listen so listening matters listening um one of my um early kind of mentors in terms of sales uh, a guy called richard mudderman back in days when i was pre-games he was amazing and i i could never do it but he basically just sat actually he didn't have his arms crossed he was always open but he just sat and said nothing nothing and he just let you talk and a lot of you will know that it's very difficult to not say something when there's silence and you're in a meeting. And the amount of information that he shouldn't have got, that he got just because he kept his mouth shut was amazing. But the important part of that isn't just what you can hear, it's the other person felt heard. That's really key. You, you want the people that you're talking to to feel heard they need to know that you know your stuff. They need to know who you are as a person authentically, but they also need to feel heard. If they felt heard, they're going to have a more positive uh, response to you. Um, Corries for closers, a phrase that comes from uh, Glenn Gary and Ross. Um, so why have I done this? Well, every meeting needs a plan. I kind of hinted at this already. 
have a snappy introduction. Ask them what they you know need, what they want. Understand what they're what they're here, what their objectives are. Um, explain your proposition in a short, sharp, relevant way. Use simple, repetitive trio statements to kind of encourage them to sort of pay attention. When you first hear something, you're kind of like, oh, what was that? When you second hear it, it kind of it starts to feel familiar. The third time you hear it, you start to understand. Using those, those kind of elements of, of the, the repetition, but also breaking things down into threes can be really powerful because we can't generally remember that many things. Obviously, I've broken that rule already. I've got five example tips and I'm telling you to do three. We all get it wrong. Um, so when you're talking to a publisher or an investor or, or a possible supplier, understand what the successful outcome in this meeting will be. More often than not, it's the next meeting. So your plan to get to the next meeting has to be flexible. Your plan to get to the next meeting has to be engaging them and understanding what will motivate them to want to talk to you again. But importantly, get to agreement on the next meeting. Actually get time, don't run out of time to say, let's meet up again, X, Y, Z. So that's really key, you know, so you want to create realistic goals, understand how you're going to navigate to them, and make sure that you've got an agreement on the next steps before the meeting comes to an end. You know, so hopefully that kind of is, is useful. So let's, let's go on to our extra tips. So take notes. I am also terrible at taking notes. If anyone uh, talks to Ella, she, uh, you will know it drives her up the wall that I never remember to take notes. But you need to, you really do. And I'm trying to get better at this. I actually sometimes bring someone in to take notes for me because I'm a projector. Um, but, you, you know, use a tool, you know, use uh, Salesforce or HubSpot. We use Pipedrive. Um, track your conversations. Think about the flow of the, of the conversations that you have with people and how they, you know, what are the different stages they go through. I've already said this, but write down the objections you get. Objections are magic dust. Because if you know why people are going to say no, you can understand how you can respond to it. Getting good at sales is about being able to know how to respond to the no's and to ideally prevent them even coming up, but also to pay attention to how you can just basically know when to stop digging a hole when you're not going anywhere. So understanding the objection, understanding if there is no way this is going to go anywhere as early as possible saves not just you time, it saves them time. How are you gonna do that if you're not tracking it. So track those conversations. Understand the last thing you said. I mean, some people are really good at this. I'm not, but if, if you're really good at this, remember the kids' names, remember the, the, their birthdays. and so on. It's genuinely human stuff that we should do because we're talking to people who we may end up having these light touch relationships for years. In some cases, for me, it's decades. You know, that really important. So it can be very difficult to take notes when you're talking. That's fine. What you don't want to do is go, talk, talk, talk. No, 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 no. Talk, talk, talk. Because you've lost eye contact. You've lost attention. But it's still find your own way to do it. Um, because the other thing is, if you don't log this down immediately, you are going to lose it. No matter how good you think your memory is, you are going to lose track of really important stuff. So write it down and write it down straight away. Next up, give value. This is really the last of the five tips. This is the last one, really. Um, try to leave the other person feeling that they've gained something valuable, some insight, some opportunity, or even just that you've acknowledged, you genuinely appreciate the information they've shared with you. This taps into a natural human reaction. You know, it's reciprocation. In general, as humans, we want to give back when we feel someone has given to us. And that's not, again, we don't have to be cynical about it. That's just understanding the way human beings are. And if we do this and you have the relevant experience, you can take it into this consulting approach, which is the method that I, I tend to use. But you have to be doing that very, very carefully. And again, I've made lots of mistakes doing this. 
your expertise needs to be coming across as useful rather than patronizing. You know, you've got to remember that you don't know everything about the other person. You don't know what they don't know. You don't know what they do know. You, you know, the Donald Rumsfeld question, you know, the, the, no, the unknown unknowns, you know, all of these things are important. So we have to be genuine, authentic and humble in the way that we share the knowledge that we have with other people and show that we're always learning. Again, back to that always learning. The value that we can get, give is also what we can learn because if we're always learning, we're always being able to give more. So really they're, they're my top five tips, but I do have a little bonus one I'm gonna chuck in. Um, so with, um, there's a particular technique called Xerox forecasting, which I, I think is quite useful to, if you wanna get more structured, if you wanna have realistic goals and achievements, you wanna think about what is it gonna to take to get your objective? So the thing I tend to do, and a lot of systems use very similar methods uh, to this, I break down each stage of a relationship with somebody. So is it a lead? Is it a prospect? Is it a proposal? Is it a com um, conversation as in you know, commercials? Um, or, you know, and is it one? So we, we have this journey, different milestones essentially for each of the conversations. At each one, we can try to assign what we think the likely percentage of completion would be. You know, 1% maybe at a lead or 10% in the prospect and so on and so forth. Now, why, why do we do this? Well, obviously it's variable and you're gonna to have to check this and constantly update it to make it as accurate as possible. But if we then assign for each deal, what stage they're at, the value that they are, and what we think the percentage chance of success would be, we can start to forecast. We can start working out what it's gonna to take to achieve our goal, whether it's money or number of deals or, or a number of people we're talking to to raise an investment, whatever the piece is that we're trying to measure, we can start forecasting the number of activities that we need to do in order to get to our goal. Do we have the manpower? Do we have the resources? Are we getting the conversion rates we should? What can we do to improve each stage? Now, by having this kind of method in the back of your mind, it's gonna make it much easier for you to think strategically about how you can be effective because you're building KPIs. That's really the crux of it. So then really my tips on business development and obviously finally, you know, the really kind of important thing is the business development in games is about an industry of finding the fun. And, and we have to be real, we have to be human, we have to be who, are, who we really are because it's a small industry. You know, we, we're, we're lucky that we're in an industry where we rarely directly compete. We're not in the cutthroat world of selling, you know, pork belly or whatever you know we're not in in share prices where people will you know sell their grandmothers we are in the industry where we're all about finding amazingly delightful engaging content experiences and we sit very nicely uh, in this industry together we can collaborate we can compare notes we can talk you know sessions like this and it's all good and being authentic being friendly being uh, you know supportive of everybody around you pays dividends you know this is an amazing industry you know i'm i wouldn't be anywhere else it's incredibly supportive there are some amazing you know, areas where slack groups and facebook groups and various other messages etc cetera, etc cetera, and people just meet up and have a beer and have a have a chat and, and and do karaoke or whatever it is that that allows them to bond and you never know where it goes and as i said some of the best deals i've ever been involved with have come out of those magic moments where we just happen to bump into somebody at a bar at some event and we get talking. And that's what it's about. It's talking with a purpose. So uh, hopefully that was interesting. I'm gonna open up for questions in a bit. I'm gonna do my biz dev bit uh, quickly. Uh, I don't wanna bore you too much, but just so you know, you know what we do, if you haven't already worked it out. Uh, so obviously we're a living games publisher. What I think is different about what we try to do is that we're trying to take the human emotion out of the um, decision making process are we going to keep it in and the what we do but whether we're the game is attractive or not we're going to try and do on data so we're very kpi driven we try to get involved early early enough to make a difference and it comes from our, our the decade or so of of working in consulting um, so we want to help games get ready by using kpi so doing early testing in the same way that um 
a lot of the um, uh, hyper casual type games have done testing before the game's even made. Um, we also do a lot of um, online usability testing. And we're trying to use that to generate what we call a net promoter score. So would you recommend this game to a friend? We find that's an amazingly powerful metric. That's all before we even go into a beta and then start looking at retention data. And then when we're comfortable, we've got the retention data, that's when we start doing um, monetization testing and working out what the return on advertising would be. And we do all of this with agreed KPIs with the developers. If anyone wants to know how we work, we even got our, um, our heads of terms of our contract is on our website, anyone can download. So we're all about basically helping games uh, get ready for launch and then scale through live operations. If you've got a game you think would be interesting to us, please let us know. We've got a whole bunch of free resources. We do webinars like this. We will put the recording out to make that available. If you want to see some of the past recordings, there's a lot of them available on our website on the knowledge base. Um, if you submit a game to us, uh, we will, we will, if it's a living game, we'll do a review of that. And that means we'll look at the market fit. We'll look at the uh, game mechanic. Uh, we'll look at the retention design and also monetization design. And we give them back to you. You know, we give you a proper report with actionable advice on it, regardless of whether it's for us or not. And I think that's a quite important thing because, that, you know, people need to see what's important to us. And so the next game, they'll know whether it's relevant or not. But also, if we can see more people be successful, we think that's a great thing for the industry as a whole. And our favorite game that we review each month, we'll give a free one hour direct workshop where we'll talk through um, specific recommendations and how they might be able to improve. So that's it. Um, I've talked about us as a living publisher. Hopefully you've got a good sense of who we are as Fundamentally Games, what our vision is, what our engagement is. Hopefully I've given you something valuable uh, and uh, you know, who knows if you'll want to reciprocate, that's entirely up to you. Um, but the key thing I want to do is make sure that we have a chance to answer any questions. And if you want to go into any details of the pieces that we've talked through, then please do. What I hope you get out of it, though, is that going into business development is about people. It's about being authentic. But it's also about having a plan. And having that plan is really something which requires you to test it. So be human, have a plan, and test. That's really it. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, obviously, feel free to uh, use the uh, chat box at the bottom of the, you know, of the screen. Um, hopefully that will make sense. Uh, you can also use the reactions if you have, have any kind of, um, uh, if you think it's good or bad, it'd be good to know, good to get some feedback. <laughs> Either that or I've lost you all. <laughs> cool, good to see that, you know, that made sense. So uh, again, if you have any thoughts or, or an advice on how we can make this more interesting or, or improve the quality of it, now please let us know. Um, thanks, Jake. Uh, thanks, Martin. Cool. Um, again, I think really this, this idea of tracking what you do, taking notes, looking at what the objections are, is going to be really key to being effective. Um, obviously, in a situation like this, where we've got people with different sources, um, and you know that really kind of helps. And, and as Jake says, no tracking of failures. Yeah, there's no such thing as failures. You know, it's just learning. I know that sounds like cliched, but I th I genuinely feel that that's the way. Uh, Zib, thank you. That's great to hear that that helped. Um, and yeah, yeah, Jake, that's that's true. Um, so just so you know, Jake, um, Ella is currently working on a uh, pitch, uh, publisher pitch presentation template. Uh, so we're doing some work at the moment looking at how basically what we would like to see uh, and building off some other examples we've seen from the folks like Royal Fury and various others as well. So we're trying to pull that together in a way where I think the next webinar will be about pitching your game. And so hopefully we'll be able to sort of get a bit more detail into kind of what different pitches are. Now, historically, we've done pitches for investors as opposed to pitches to publishers. Um, what we found is that people don't understand the difference. And it's really important that you, you clearly differentiate because, again, back to what I said before, what does the other person need to see? What's going to get them promoted? What's going to... And it's very different if you're a publisher than if you're an investor. So understanding those, those needs, you know, for example, a business model, absolutely vital in the best of deck. Is it so important in a publisher deck? Probably not. Some indication 
of what you think success could look like is absolutely there, but it's tricky. Uh, yes, and uh, and as Jake is saying, um, you know, getting a generic pitch is one thing, but tailoring it to each publisher is also important. Uh, is it, I find it a tricky one because one of the things I find is that if I tailor a pitch deck to a particular company, I end up chucking more details in when actually I want to strip that back, leave the pitch deck as simple as possible, but then talk the specifics through. But it's a really interesting tension between these two things, because if they don't put publisher specific information that shows that you understand them, when the scout takes it to the, um, you know, the person who's in, responsible for releasing money, how do they know? How do they know those specifics that you you understand what they need? So yeah, it's, it's a tr tricky one. That I used to always struggle with how much information I put in a pitch deck versus talk through because of that. When I was in internal inside large corporations, I had to know that the person who had it could read through and have all the information to hand. Whereas if I'm doing a talk to an audience, I need them to be paying attention to my words, not what's on the screen. But I need the words on the screen to emphasize my words. So it's really different, really difficult as well. Cool. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Looking like we're all good. So um, obviously, if you have any questions, please let us know. We have recorded this, as I'm sure you've worked out. Uh, we will be sharing a recording hopefully this week, uh, depending on how quickly we can get that edited. Uh, and obviously, if in the meantime, you have any questions or thoughts or feedback on how we do this, these webinars, how we can improve them, uh, and even down to how we can communicate them to other people, that would be greatly appreciated. You may also know that we have a Discord group um, that Discord group we'll, we'll send you the link to, um, but it's specifically intended so that we can have ongoing conversations like this with anyone who's interested in sharing professional information about making games. Um, so obviously please feel free to uh, join us on uh, Discord as well. So unless I can see anything else, I think we're all done. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, thank you very much for participating. I hope it was useful. I hope you took something away from it. I'd love to know what that was. Please feel free to ping me to let me know if there was something you, you particularly took away. Uh, I saw the uh, comment on note taking of, um, uh, of failures. That was great to see. Uh, definitely recommend that. Uh, and, and again, thank you all for being here and uh, hopefully I'll speak to you all again soon. Hopefully some of you in person. Thanks Alex. Thanks all. Take care, folks. Stay safe.